Hello, I'm Matthew Bay, a senior analyst at Stratfor, a Rain company. This podcast is brought to you by Stratfor Worldview, Rain's premier digital publication for objective geopolitical intelligence analysis. Sign up for the free Stratfor newsletter at worldview.stratfor.com. You're listening to Stratfor's Essential Geopolitics podcast from Rain. I'm Emily Donahue. In late April, the Italian government announced a plan to spend more than 220 billion euros over the next few years to boost economic growth. Can this be a plan that finally generates sustainable growth in the third largest economy in the EU? I'm joined by Adriano Bassoni, Stratfor Senior Europe Analyst at Rain. Hello, Adriano. Hey, Emily. So let's hop right in here. Italy is one of the largest economies in the world, and yet its growth has been quite low in recent years. Can you explain why that might be? Yeah, Italy is a very interesting country because it has a diversified economy with a strong manufacturing sector, an incredibly attractive tourism sector, a well-developed agricultural sector that produces food products that the entire planet loves, Um, There aren't many countries that are as successful in as many different sectors as Italy. And yet, as you mentioned, the Italian economy has experienced very low growth rates in recent decades, and it was one of the worst hit countries by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, There are many reasons for this situation. One of them was the introduction of the euro, which had a negative impact on the Italian economy. Before the euro was introduced in the early 2000s, Italy would resort to monetary policy to deal with the economic crisis. It would devalue its currency to make its exports more competitive. It would tolerate a bit of inflation in order to protect jobs. But after Italy lost its currency, this option was no longer on the table. Um, And then there's the issue of red tape. Italy has a very complex, very cumbersome set of norms and regulations and bureaucracy that deters investment. The same applies to the Kurds, where legal procedures could take years. Italy constantly ranks very low in the World Bank's ease of doing business report, mostly because of its red tapes and, and, and bureaucracy. Another important element is that Italy has a large informal economy, which also has a negative impact on both state revenue and economic growth. And this is particularly true in some areas of the services sector, such as um, tourism or, 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 or even in the agricultural sector. And then, of course, there's the issue of Italy's productivity problems. For years, the Italian state would help national companies financially, which in a way prevented them from becoming more modern and and, and more productive over time. And since the second half of the 1990s, productivity growth has been weak, both by historical standards and also compared with with the main uh, economies in the the Eurozone. And of course, um, there's the issue of Italy's geographic disparities. Northern Italy is a heavily industrialized region with a robust services sector and a relatively prosperous um, urban centers. The south, on the contrary, is um, less developed. It's more agricultural, it's more dependent on state subsidies, which drain uh, significant uh, resources from the state. Um, There are lots of negative stereotypes about criminal activity in the south, But the truth, the sad truth, I would say, is that um, the mafia and other organizations may have originated in the south, but they are active across the country and and, and they also make significant money in the north. Adriano, Italy also seems to have been experiencing many years of political upheaval. I assume both contribute to the other. Yeah, you are correct. There is a connection between political crises and uh, low levels of economic growth. Italy has a parliamentary system where coalitions of two and often more parties are needed to form governments. These coalitions tend to be fragile. Governments tend to change all the time. But the the interesting thing is that in many ways, this system is a reaction to fascism and the events that preceded World War II, as the Italian constitution was actually designed to prevent another strong dictator from taking over. So every time we see a fragile government in Italy, in a way, it's, it's the constitution doing what it was designed to do. But of course, 
this makes long-term planning extremely difficult because governments are constantly changing and, and we know that uncertainty is kind of the enemy of um, investment and, and economic growth. Um, this is not a hundred percent negative. Um, while Italian politics is really chaotic, Italian politicians have also proven to be flexible and coalitions between the right and the left are not impossible, as, as is the case in many other countries like Spain, for example, where the right and the left would never be in a coalition together. Um, Italian politicians are always ready to appoint a technocratic government in times of deep crisis. This is what happened almost a decade ago when the Italian parliament appointed a former EU commissioner, Mario Monti, as prime minister to cope with the um, Eurozone crisis. It happens again earlier in 2021 when the Italian parliament appointed former European Central Bank President Mario Draghi to come up with a plan to spend uh, the billions of euros that Italy will receive from the European Union. So in times of crisis, um, Italian politicians have proven to be quite pragmatic, especially when it comes to appointing a technocrat or somebody who is not a politician to, to, to do their dirty work, so to speak. But of course, this ideological flexibility does not come for free. And Italian voters are some of the most skeptical and disenchanted in Europe. Support for the Eurozone is very low in Italy. Populist and extremist parties and anti-establishment parties are on the rise. This means that political risk affects Italy not only because of the lack of continuity between governments, but also because people are angry and, 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 and or are often tired of their leaders and the status quo. In the past, Adriano, you have spoken about debt in Italy. Can you dive into that a little here? What, what's going on with the country's debt? Well, Italy has the highest debt level in Europe in absolute terms and the second highest after Greece in relative terms. This means that the Italian government is constantly struggling to keep its fiscal deficit under control and send a message to markets and, and investors that its debt is sustainable. Um, this problem is made worse by Italy's terrible demographics. The country has the lowest fertility rate in the world after Japan, while um, recent economic crises have resulted in uh, rising emigration. This reduces the potential for long-term growth because the number of workers and consumers will decrease in the coming years, which means that Italy will struggle to grow out of its debt. Um, it also means that the government will have to increase spending in healthcare, pensions and other areas to sustain its aging population, which will probably uh, result in the government taking even more debt. Um, of course, this is not necessarily a problem as long as Italy's lenders believe that this debt is sustainable. Um, Italy's borrowing costs have been relatively low in recent months, in part because of intervention by the European Central Bank in debt markets. But of course, we can't take this situation for granted. And that's why every time there is political instability in Italy, markets, investors, and, and the rest of the world starts looking at its debts. It's kind of a ticking bomb, according to some experts. So, Adriana, will the new prime minister have any effect on the Italian economy? Well, um, the, the plan that the Italian government presented to spend EU money from the recovery fund is, is very interesting. Um, it includes proposals to accelerate the energy transition in Italy, which is a crucial requirement from the European Commission. We know that Brussels is asking uh, countries to spend a lot of, of money from the recovery fund on the energy transition. But what I find particularly interesting about the plan presented by Prime Minister Mario Draghi is that it calls for a faster digitalization and modernization of Italy's public administration, which is definitely long overdue. It also plans to address long-standing bottlenecks in Italy's legal system and local administrations that have um, hindered growth in, in recent decades. Italy's legal system is one of the slowest in Europe, which, which sometimes pushes investment away. So in, in, in this regard, um, the Mario Draghi is touching on, on, on very crucial aspects of, of the Italian economy. But of course, his success depends on some factors that he does not fully control. 
To begin with, he's not a politician. He's the former president of the European Central Bank, and he depends on support from parties with very different political agendas. Italy's main political parties are interested in keeping Draghi in, in his place in the short to medium term because of Italy's economic crisis, but at some point they will start to reassess their political strategies and reconsider whether they could benefit from leaving the government and moving to the opposition. This means that Draghi will spend significant time, energy and political capital in implementing his reforms, but also in trying to keep his government alive. The second factor is external. The crisis of 2020 was so deep that the EU decided that it was time to start spending and forget about fiscal discipline. This is the kind of thinking that made the massive EU recovery fund possible. But the question is, what happens when the sense of urgency is gone? I think most Northern European countries will return to their pre-pandemic positions that demand fiscal tightening in EU member states, especially those in the South, in exchange for EU money. Um, Germany is an interesting uh, case because it will hold a general election in September that will probably result in a centrist or even a center-left government, which should be good news for Italy because it would be a government in Berlin that is willing to tolerate countries in Southern Europe having um, large fiscal deficits. But a conservative government in, 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 in Germany that returns to the fiscal discipline mantra that, that used to define Germany in, in, in the past few years would reduce political support for Italy. To make a long story short, Italy is facing a historic opportunity. Of course, there's a lot of money coming to, to Italy in the coming years, but there are also significant risks ahead. Um, as Mario Draghi himself said, Italy is a beautiful but fragile country, which I think is a great way to describe the country's current situation. Adriana Bassoni is Stratfor Senior Europe Analyst at Rain. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you, Emily. The Essential Geopolitics podcast is powered by Rain, the Risk Assistance Network and Exchange. You can try Strat4 Worldview, Rain's leading geopolitical intelligence platform. Sign up today for our free newsletter at worldview.strat4.com. That's worldview.strat4.com. I'm Emily Donahue. Thanks for listening.